Patience is, is it's trusting other people into God's hands. See, when somebody comes at you in a way that makes you angry, what you need to realize is God is still working on them. The thought process in your head is it should be, man, Lord, please save this person. Welcome to the Reach College Podcast with your speaker, Pastor Taylor Gatt. So we're going to talk about a definition today, definition of a word. And I was looking through a book, was not the dictionary, called The 260 Journey that had some definitions. So we're going to start there. I'm going to read you these definitions. Uh, let's see. Calories. The tiny creatures that live in your closet and sew your clothes a little tighter every night. Study, the act of texting, eating, and watching YouTube with an open textbook nearby. (laughs) Latte, Italian for you paid too much for that coffee. (laughs) Vegetarian, a Latin uh, Latin phrase from centuries ago. Its original meaning is really bad hunter. (laughs) Tomorrow, the best time to do everything you had planned to do today. Beat, a device used for finding Legos in the dark. And love giving someone the last piece of cake, no matter how much you want it. So that is uh, obviously just some funny definitions of of words. Um, we are going to talk really about the definition of the word love. Now, the definition of the word love is is really lost in our culture. I mean, we've we've all heard this, right? You know, we talk about how many definitions for for the word love, or how many different words for the word love the Greeks had, right? And then in our in our culture, it's like, I love tacos, and I love my wife, and somehow, like, that's the same word, and we're supposed to discern the different, you know, hopefully very different meaning of <laughs> those two sentences, right? But we don't always, and so the reality is, and I don't want to start right here, is that the definition of love is to point people towards Jesus Christ. That is uh, the be-all, end-all of the definition. There's nothing else in your entire life. I always tell you guys, if you bake cookies for your neighbor every single day and you never tell them about Jesus, you did nothing. So you have to love people by pointing them to Jesus Christ. So we are in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we've we've called this series Church Fails because the church in Corinth is struggling to act like a church should act. And so we have this book in the Bible because Paul essentially walks through uh, all these issues going on in Corinth, one at a time, just saying, don't do that, don't do that, stop doing that, quit doing that. And we can learn a lot about our own behavior from a book that has all of these negative examples. It's um, scary how much like the church in Corinth we end up being when we take a really close look. And so uh, even if we can pride ourselves on one chapter and go, hey, we're not doing that, the very next chapter you're going to run into a verse and be like, oh, Darn it. Because you are inevitably going to see yourself everywhere you look in the Bible. And uh, Corinthians, uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians are books that we as a community should look at and say, what are we called to, to be as a body of believers? How are we supposed to live the Christian life out? Um, the problem with the church in Corinth and what we're going to see today is that they were not, essentially Paul's going to sum up all the problems that they've been having through 12 chapters so far in that they're not loving each other. They're not being selfless towards each other. And so he's going to point them to this. And I want you to understand, chapter 13 is both a digression from what how, how he's been talking and also not at all. So in the sense that it's a digression, he is going, don't do this, don't do this, fix this, don't do this. And then he gets to 13 and he really just launches into this, like the whole thing is a monologue, but he launches into this like separate piece where he's just like, Look at the better way to live. Look at love. But at the same time, it still fits the theme because if you look, as we look at the definition of love in this chapter, so much of it is is how not to do it. And why is that? Because he's pointing at their behaviors. He's saying love doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. And he's not pulling these things out of the abstract. He's talking about things that the church in Corinth is struggling with. 
that they are exhibiting in the way that they are pretending to love each other. And so he is calling them out even as he gets into chapter 13. Now, the first thing uh, Paul is going to do is he's essentially going to ask us this. What is the point of anything we're doing if it's not based in love, if it's not wrapped around love? What is the point? So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of mankind and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions to charity, and, and if I surrender my body so that I may glory, but do not have love, it does me no good. Okay, so I've told you guys, I told you guys when we started chapter 12 that we were going to have a conversation about speaking in tongues as this unfolds. Um, but really, that conversation unfolds in chapters 14 and 15, more specifically. Um, and so what I've tried not to do, I told you guys last week when we did 12 that you were going to have more questions than answers by the time we were done talking about the little bit we were going to talk about in chapter 12. And you're really going to continue to have those same questions all the way through until we get through with chapter 14, because um, that's where Paul's going to deal with it. But at the same time that I am not going to camp on this, we have to address the verses as they come to us, right? So while we're in 13, we're going to we're going to continue to address what Paul is uh, pointing at with this tongues conversation, how he's kind of steering the conversation towards a conclusion with that. OK, now. Um, I want you to understand that that, again, Paul never it, it, it's almost frustrating for us as we have the conversation because Paul never just outright says this is what's right and this is what's wrong. Right. He navigates it and it, and it would be silly of him to do that because earlier we saw that he navigates what's sin and what's not sin by what points to Jesus and what doesn't, right? So he never wants to draw hard lines where he says, this action is sinful. He wants to say, well, does that action distract people from Jesus? Sinful. Does that action point people to Jesus? Not sinful. And so Paul, in the same way, is not going to come straight out and address tongues as just a hard line, this is this is what it is. It's this answer, right? And so if somebody preaches that to you from Corinthians, I think they're actually stepping out further than Paul went. And that's that's inappropriate in my in my view. I can't go further than what Paul said in his scripture, right? All I can do is explain what I believe the word of God teaches, okay? So all that being said, here's the part that we need to look at just for today when it comes to this the tongues conversation. This verse, this first verse is often taken uh, I think drastically out of context, and I'm going to show you why. So that first verse is, if I speak with the tongues of mankind and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And when we read that, what we see or what people do is they take that verse in a vacuum and they go, see, look, Paul says he prays with the tongues of angels. Okay, that's that's how that verse is used by itself. Okay, now here's the problem with that. First of all, you can't just read one verse by itself and then form a doctrine. OK, so look at verses one through three. What do you see? A super Christian. OK, Paul outlines like the perfect Christian in, in just verses one through three. The entire section is hyperbole, right? He is not saying, even though I'm a perfect Christian, but if I don't have love, it's worthless. He's describing something that doesn't exist, right? That doesn't can't happen, that we're not capable of. And he's saying that even if you're striving for these impossible uh, reaches, even if you were to achieve them, but you were not loving to other people, it wouldn't matter. Okay, so the language is hyperbole. But then let's, let's add something to it. In Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 8, we see this. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Okay. You, that is the exact same language. In the Greek, it's the same words for if. And here's the thing. What Paul is not saying in Galatians is there's, there's angels out there from heaven who might show up and preach to you a different gospel. Don't listen to them. That's not what he's saying, right? So you can't, 
you can't take that language in one place and go, well, clearly it's a hypothetical. And then in another place and go, see, he's advocating for something. He's saying it's true. It's real. Now, again, that is not in and of itself the argument. You're going to walk away today with just this one verse of analysis and be like, I still don't know if it's real or not, or if it's right or not, right? We're not going to get there, okay? And I want you to understand we're not going to get there today. What I want you to understand is we are going to break uh, chapter 14 into two weeks, and then we're going to break chapter 15 into three weeks. So we are going to take some time. Uh, that's part of why we've kind of raced through some of the other parts of Corinthians, because we're going to really dissect some of these last chapters in more detail. Okay, so you're going to have to be content today that that's all we're going to say about it. All right, so moving on. The thesis of this whole section is it's not about tongues. The thesis of this whole section is what's the point of being this kind of person if you're not loving? Okay, so let's look at each element. He says, if I was to have all prophecy and know all mysteries, right? So the point of prophecy is to be a truth teller. Okay, well, you know what happens to truth-telling people who don't have love in the mix, they're jerks, right? And, and we always hear that, right? Well, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just telling the truth. Yeah, you're being a big jerk is what you're being, right? And so the, the idea is, what's the point of knowing all the mysteries of God if you're not presenting those to people in a loving and gentle way that actually coaxes them to Jesus, right? If you're off-putting, then having all that knowledge, all that prophecy, all those mysteries, it does nothing for you. Right, so he says, don't don't be a, a a prophet that is without love. He says, faith with so think about faith with love. Faith with love is to do God's work. Right, so we see this verse about moving mountains. What is what's the idea behind moving mountains? If you are on task, God's task, and that mountain is in your way, God is not going to let any mountain stop him from doing what he wants to do. Right, and so if I am on task, right. And, and I want you to understand both the literal and figurative nature of this. If you've ever heard somebody talk about praying for like a million dollars to raise money for something and, and God came through in like a miraculous way, that is a mountain being moved. That is somebody saying, God, I want you to move the mountain of this money that we have in front of us. But I want you to understand the, that the literal nature of this is that God will do whatever it takes for his mission to, to progress forward, right? Um, that's why we look in the Old Testament and we see these drastic miracles happened because God was on mission and he wasn't going to let anything stop him, whether that be, you know, Pharaoh or a, an entire body of water, right? He was going to move it. And so God is in this, in this moment, what Paul is saying is you need to have faith to do God's work, but it's to do God's work. And God's work is, is a work of love. See, because what do you do when you remove the love part from the faith to move mountains? You have magic tricks. Right? You have a show. You have somebody who's trying to, I don't know, show off, be impressive. Not somebody who's trying to win people to the faith. Right, And so the faith to move mountains, to, to pray for a million dollars, is not to pray for a million dollars so I can buy a nicer house. It's to pray for a million dollars so I can give it to God's work, God's missions. Right, That is why we're supposed to have faith to move mountains. And I want you to notice that both prophecy and faith, we just covered the whole thing. What is the point of the entire Bible, cover to cover? Love God and love others. That is the gospel. The gospel is love God and love others, right? I love God by loving what he loves, which is people, and I love others, love people, by pointing them to God. That's the whole Bible, right? And so what we see in prophecy is love others, tell them the truth in all gentleness, and love God in faith by being about his work. Right? That is the, encompass, the encompassing of the entire Bible right there. He says, if I sell all possessions and sacrifice myself for Christ, what does that look like without love? He says, for your own glory, for, so that I may glory. Okay, I want you to understand, this is, I think, one of the most humbling moments I had last year. I, I told you guys about this. I got to go uh, randomly. I was filling in for AJ, but I got to go... Uh, preach at a like a youth conference, thousand kids. Never preached to that many people in my entire life. I mean, and when I say preach, I mean like I literally did a gospel presentation and an invitation. So I was talking for ten minutes, right? And in the midst of that, as I was making the invitation, it, I just remember God just saying to me, 
what good are you to these people if if it's about your name? Like how, like my name can't save anybody. I don't know that any one of those kids even knows who I am or remembers me at all. And who cares? Because remembering my name won't get them anywhere. It won't get them that listen, they're not going to get up to St. Peter at the gate and be like listen to Taylor Gabbard preach one time and he's going to be like, "Oh, get out of my face." Right? Like that's all that's going to happen. <laughs> It's not going to matter, right? But on the other hand, if I can present them the name of Jesus Christ, if I can give them his name and they receive that, well, then his name, now, that can do something for them, right? And so the reality is, what is the point of selling all your possessions and sacrificing your body so that you may glory? It doesn't accomplish anything. It's not good for anything. The point of love is to get people to Jesus. That's how we love other people. So that is, the, the question is, without love, what is the point? And then now we're going to see, and, and I know we've all been waiting for this moment, so what is love? <laughs> Thank you. All right, so that's as close to singing as I'm going to get up here. So, um, All right, so I'm going to, I just want you guys to hear this quote. This is a C.S. Lewis quote. He said, love is not a is not affectionate, I'm sorry, love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. This is the goal of love. It is completely selfless. It is completely external to you. It is about other people <clears throat> meeting Jesus Christ. That is the goal of love. Again, why, why do I say that? Why do I say that that's the only really loving thing? Everything else we do loving should be funneling towards that end because every loving thing I do short of showing people Jesus Christ, they may still land separated from him forever. And that that doesn't cut it because they will never spend, they won't spend their eternity thinking, at least my friend was nice to me. No, they will be asking, why didn't I ever hear his name? Why didn't I ever hear the name that mattered? Right? And so that is why we show people Jesus. Look at verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. does not keep an account of wrongs suffered. does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. It keeps, it keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So I have the... NASB Bible, and it's largely a little bit more um, clunky moving through. Uh, you've probably heard this before, probably in a wedding, and you probably heard like the ESV or the NKJV version, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful passage. I think that because we hear it so much, we numb out to it, right? We hear it, and it's like very cliche to us at this point. So we're going to talk about each of these elements in this definition, and we're going to look at what what love is, right? We're going to look at what love is doing, what the being of love is, and what the object of love is. Understand that the object of love is external to you, right? It is God or it is others. But any other version of love, like the world's self-love, right? That is not true love. That actually is just selfishness. Right, And that is a perversion of what love truly is. Now, don't mishear me. This is not to say, I mean, there's an inherent nature of this in the way the Bible's written, right? When we're told to love others, how are we told to love them? The way we love ourselves, right? So that there is, by definition, that built-in love of self, but God is almost playing to that and saying, you already love yourself, now love other people, right? We're not ever advocating in the Bible for only loving ourself and putting ourself before others. And the example, the example is Christ and Christ's likeness. Go find the place where he did that. It's, it's, it's not there. He was always loving other people. He was always putting other people first. And he understood that even his time to get away and pray to be with the Lord, that was loving the Lord so he could be filled up so that he could go love other people again, right? That's what Jesus was doing. So we're going to look at each element of this. Now, the first question I want to ask is, 
why do we love? Like, why do we love God and why do we love others? Right? Romans 5.8 tells us that God proved his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we know that, for starters, we were enemies of an all-powerful and perfect God. And instead of just immediately erasing us from all existence, he went out of his way to love us first. Right? He went out of his way to make peace with us and make it so that we could be right with him. Right? We see in 1 John 4.11, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So why do we love others? Because we have been extended a love that we don't deserve from a God who didn't have to give it. And at this point, how could you not extend that to other people? How could you not turn around and love other people? Right? That is, again, the definition of selfishness. We also told by the Bible that we love him because he first loved us. See, here's the deal. If God didn't love us first, you never know about him. You can't hear about him. You like God could have hidden from all humanity and would have never found him. And that would have just been it. I mean, that would have been he wouldn't have had to send us to hell. We would have just been there. Right? And so the reality is we love God because we see that he is not only responsible for our existence in the first place, but then redeems us out of a broken state that we had no hope of escaping. So we love him because of this. So the first things we see are we are patient and kind. Love is patient and kind. Now these go together. They're relational. Uh, patient, here's a good definition of patience for you. If you want to understand how do, I, how do I truly have patience with people, because a lot of times what it means to us is we bite our tongue like really hard and just clench our fist, like, I'm going to be patient with this person instead of kill them, right? <laughs> but what patience is, is it's trusting other people into God's hands. See, when somebody comes at you in a way that makes you angry, what you need to realize is God is still working on them. He still loves them. He's still trying to make them better and, and complete perfection in them. Honestly, when somebody comes at you that's a non-Christian, the thought process in your head is it should be, man, Lord, please save this person. How could they possibly act any differently? They only have access to sinful actions and sinful thoughts. And so I want that person to meet Jesus so that we can be brothers instead of enemies. right? And so patience is trusting other people into God's hands. And when you trust other people into God's hands, it's a lot easier to be kind to them. It's a lot easier to treat them Kindly. I mean, this is, you know, again, I, I always use this same analogy about punching a little kid in a parking lot. But if you, if you have real patience for a child who is swinging on you, right, what, what you don't do is just like, this is Sparta, that kid, into the next world. <laughs> you, you have kindness, right? And, and you know that because you look at a little kid and you think, it's just a little kid. And what, what real harm can this, this child do to me? But then we don't extend that to anybody like above the age of like 11, maybe, you know, I know if a 13 year old comes at me in parlor, we're have a different conversation, you know, why? Because I'm not, I'm not being patient with them, right? And I'm not being kind with them. Okay. It says not be jealous. Okay. There's a difference between being jealous of and being jealous for. Okay. God is jealous for us. What does that mean? God is jealous for that we are not stolen from him by other objects because those are not good for us because he cares about us, right? This is uh, my favorite version of this is the difference between, you know, if you go look at, um, uh, is it uh, Hosea who marries the prostitute? And, and she runs away, right, to go back into prostitution. And he's not jealous um, like of her and that he's mad at her. He is told by God to go get her back, to be jealous for her. And the imagery of that moment in the Bible is when we run away with our sin, God is, is jealous for us. He wants us back because he knows that he's the only thing that's good for us. That's different than being mad at us, right? And so we're told to be not to be jealous of. Um, the next two go together, does not brag and is not arrogant. This is to keep praise on oneself. Right? This is the opposite of humility. This is the building up of self constantly to just say, look, look at me, look at how great I am, look at how cool I am. Right? This, 
That's not loving. He says not disgraceful. I want you to understand that the word disgraceful here, it has a sexual connotation, right? It's to not act shamefully sexually, right? And uh, again, this is not in, in the abstract, right? What's happening in the church in Corinth? If we back up to the beginning, there are allegations of sexual immorality in the church at this point that they are winking at. They know it exists, and they're not doing anything about it. And he's saying, that's not loving. That's not how we're called to act towards each other and with each other. We're not. We're supposed to be upholding each other's purity in protecting each other. Now, this is, by the way, I always have to clarify when I say this because of the way our culture for so long has, our church culture has so long approached sexual immorality. This is not about perfection. This is not that if you have ever messed up, just Go ahead and get up and leave. Don't come back to church. I don't want to see you again. Like, that's not what we're talking about. We're actually talking about that when you mess up, helping you escape from sexual immorality. Because if you've ever been trapped in sexual immorality, whether that's pornography or or just a sexually immoral relationship, you know it, it gets its hooks in you. It's it's a slavery. I mean, we talk about like addiction to drugs. Um, and to a certain extent, there's there's a part of that addiction that is mind numbing, if you will, uh, we're so conscious when we're involved in sexual immorality. And so this, the misery is not numbed almost at all, right? When you're stuck in enslaved in sexual morality, you almost just get to feel all of it. You feel the whole enslaved process and you're miserable. It degrades you. And the goal is, is here is to protect you from that by showing you how to live in accordance with love. So you're not enslaved to that. It says, does not seek your own benefit. Okay, now, I, I always have to clarify when people take things too far. Does not seek your own benefit does not mean to be a doormat. Okay, so some people have a proclivity to be so selfless to the point of unhealthiness, right? Um, this is not to always and forever just let people run over you, okay? To not seek your own benefit, though, is to not be selfish with other people. To not be constantly trying to get just what's yours or get what you can out of a relationship. But that is not the same as letting someone who is doing that do that to you over and over and over and over again. Right? That's also unhealthy. Right? That's not, and, and if you know that's not love, it's not love when they do it either. So it's not loving of you to let somebody do that to you constantly. Right? Because they are by definition not loving you. The next two go together. Not provoked. And no record of wrong. Okay, so not provoked. Ecclesiastes 7 9 says, Don't let your spirit rush to be angry, for anger abides in the heart of fools. James 1 19 through 20 says, uh, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of, the righteousness of God. And then um, I didn't look up the psalm reference for this, but there's a psalm that says, Refrain from anger, give up your rage, do not be agitated, it can only bring harm. What do all of those verses have in common? I, I've memorized verses on anger because that's my problem, right? That's the thing I'm dealing with all the time. So that's the thing I have focused on. And you know what I've, I've noticed about all of those verses? They are all about producing Christ's likeness in the other person. I shouldn't be getting angry with you because I should be helping you get to Christ's likeness. And when I get angry with you, I stomp on that process immediately. I make it about me. It's now selfishness. It's not loving. It's not producing hope in you. It's not producing faith in you. It's not producing love in you. It's just me making it about me, my rights, my offense, what you did to me, right? That is why we're not supposed to be provoked. And then no record of wrong is to not hold grudges. Now, I want you to see this. Um, there's, there's a difference between, I think there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, okay? Forgiveness is one-sided. You, you are called to forgive. Reconciliation takes two people. You're not reconciled until you have both gone through the process of forgiveness and even repentance for what happened. Okay? I want you to understand, reconciliation is not always in your hands. Reconciliation can sometimes take years. It can sometimes be that it's only going to happen in heaven. There can be reconciliation that does not occur right here in this life, okay? But you are called to be forgiving. That is, that's a command. That has nothing to do with whether or not there 
they get on board and you are reconciled, that has everything to do with you realizing the magnitude of what you have been forgiven of and not withholding that from other people. It is, it is not okay for us to... Here's the deal. Every time that somebody sins against you, there should be a reality in your, in your heart that looks at that sin and realizes you are guilty of that towards Jesus Christ to an infinite degree. You are not, you're not better than the person who has attacked you. It should cause you to go, man, that hurt. I can't believe I did that to Jesus. I can't believe that I hurt him in that same way. That is why we're called to forgive. Now, I hope that you find reconciliation. You, you should seek that to the best of your ability. But you should not, you should not hold out on forgiveness because you can't get to reconciliation yet. They're not the same thing. Okay. Then it says not to rejoice uh, in unrighteousness, but to rejoice in truth. Right. So 1 John is an entire book that talks about walking in the light, walking in the way of the Lord, and not walking in the darkness in the way of sin. Right. So to walk in the light is to live a life that is in connection with the body of believers, that is confessing your sins one to another, that is bearing each other's burdens, right? That's all love. Whereas to walk, to, to rejoice in unrighteousness is to not only sin, but to drag other people into your sin, right? And here's the deal. I don't care how secret your sin is. It does not only have a consequence against you. And the Bible has, is replete with examples of this, but, but if you pay attention long enough in your own life, you will see how your sin affects other people. Because it never stays just in the dark, quiet places of your bedroom. Uh, we're going to read verse 7 again, because it's been a second. Verse 7 says, It keeps every confidence, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Okay, so this is um, fourfold. Uh, these all kind of go together. There's like a, a chiasm happening here. So the, the first one is keeps confidence. This is to bear burdens, right? To to When you come to me, and you're burdened with something, and you say, man, I, I just, I'm dealing with all this. What I'm doing is, is, and what we should all be doing, is that we take that from them, and we say, I'm going to help you carry this. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to be there for you to, to vent, to work through this. I'm going to be there to encourage you with scripture. I'm going to bear this burden with you. Even just, sometimes, sometimes just not having a burden in secret is all you need. Just that somebody else knows is, is all it takes, right? So we bear one another's burdens. That's keeping confidence. Then it says, believes all things and hopes all things. So let's talk about context for a second, right? Believes all things. Can that be taken out of context? Drastically. Where is that found? In the Bible, okay? It's not talking about anything you want to believe ever. It's talking about the gospel, right? You can't snatch that verse out of the context of the whole book and be like, see, Love doesn't have restrictions on what people believe in. Like, no, that is not how this works at all, okay? So the context of the fact that we are reading a verse is that we are talking about believing in the gospel. The phrase doesn't even mean all things. It means all ways, right? We, we, again, translation is tricky. This is a more word-for-word -word translation. So it's going to translate almost exact literal phrasing. And if you've ever worked with language, that doesn't happen very smoothly, right? And so the key here is that he's saying always believes, never gives up believing, right? Always hopes, never gives up hoping. And then he says endures all things. So this is essentially to close off the entire section by saying does, endures by doing all this stuff always, never giving up, right? But I want you to see this section keeps confidence and endures all things are both present. They are the current, what we're living in right now, whereas believes all things and hopes all things, they are for the future. You are, you are having faith and hope in things to come. And the reason that it's built like that is because Paul is saying the things that, are, that we believe and hope for in the future, they fuel us to endure things and to keep confidence right now. The way I live in the present is, is because internally I'm hoping for and having faith in things to come. Because if I don't believe that Jesus is coming back, there is no reason. I, I wouldn't even be in this building right now, right? 
If I didn't believe Jesus was coming back, this is a waste of my Sunday morning. Okay? So because I believe in things to come and I hope for things to come, I now keep confidence and endure all things. So this is Paul telling us that this is what love is. It is the gospel. Right? It is that Jesus Christ came to give himself for us so that we could be with him. Right? To, that he died for us. Right? That is the gospel message. That is what love is. So now the question is, how do we walk in that love? So I have here a, uh, a series of answers from children when they were asked, what does love mean? Okay? So this is Billy, age four. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Terry, age four. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Carl, age five. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> Chrissy, age six. Love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. And then Rebecca, age eight. When my grandmother got arthritis, she could not bend over and paint her toenails anymore, so my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when he got arthritis in his hands, too. That's love. <laughs> okay, those are cute, right? But here's the thing about all those definitions. They are, quite literally, childish definitions of love, right? And here's the deal. While all of those have an essence of truth in them, like something selfless about them, that's not the full picture of love, right? And even though we've all had childish definitions of love through our life, we need to grow into a real definition, an adult definition. We need to grow into a true, mature understanding of what love is. Now, I will, I will posit this to you. One of the things that I deal with a lot in this age group is the... the misconception that if you love somebody, you will be physically intimate with them before marriage. I want you to understand something. The Bible is very clear about this. If you love someone, you will wait to be physically intimate with them until marriage, right? And how do I know? Because by definition, when I beat marriage to the punch, I am actually loving myself because right now I want to be gratified. Whereas when I love someone else, I say, no, 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 I'm going to protect that gratification for marriage when it's in the appropriate context and when it's going to be healthy and uplifting and, and safe, right? That is selfless. That is loving someone else. That is not me being the object of my love, right? And so look at verse 8. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease if there is knowledge, it will be done away with, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. So, so the point of this whole passage, again, you can get hung up right there where it says like tongues will cease. Okay, but you have to understand what this, that's not actually a good argument for that. Because what he's talking about here is when Jesus comes back. Right, see the enduring nature of love is that love is going to be the thing that we still have when Jesus gets here. The rest of it's going to be unnecessary, right? What else are we going to need besides love when we get to heaven? Think about it like this. What are you going to need to have faith in when you get to heaven? Faith is hoping for things unseen. And you're going to see Jesus face to face. You're going to need faith. You're not going to need hope. Hope is that we hope we have this expectation that Jesus is coming back. We're not going to need that anymore because we will be with him, right? Love is the only thing that will remain at the end. All the rest of this is going to go away. All the rest of this won't matter. So that makes it the only enduring and eternal one of these things, which means it should be our focus. I want everything I focus on in this life to last forever. Like, why would I build up anything that's going to perish? What would be the point of that? Right? Like, why would I just, like, hoard bananas so they can all just turn brown in a closet somewhere? 
right? That doesn't make sense. I want things that are going to endure and last, right? Look at verse 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. And when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been known fully. So he gives two analogies here. He gives an analogy, a child analogy, and a mirror analogy. So we're going to look at both of these. The child analogy is one of growth and maturity. It's to grow, essentially what he's saying is, we grow out of our bad definitions of love. We grow out of our childish definitions of love. Now, the actual context, what he's saying, it's even broader than that. He's actually saying, we're going to grow out of faith and hope. We're going to grow into an eternity where we don't even need those anymore, right? Now, there's a premature version of that, right? I, I am uh, reading a book right now by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. Fantastic book. You're going to hear me talk about it a couple times over the next couple weeks because it's just stuck in my head, okay? This book, a bunch of people get on a bus in hell and they go to visit heaven. And uh, C.S. was very clear that he's not actually postulating like what heaven and hell are going to be like in this book. It's just imaginary. But they go up to heaven and they're basically given an opportunity to stay. Every one of, every one of these people on this bus that has been sent to hell, they get told that basically you can you can be here. Like you can be with God. You can stay forever. You can live here. It'll be great. And every single one of them doubles down on their sin, doubles down on their rejection of God, gets back on the bus and goes back to hell. Now, C.S. Lewis's point in this is that every single one of these people are, sorry, C.S. Lewis's point is no one will be in hell who did not choose to be there. That is the point that C.S. Lewis is making. But what we see in that book is people who did not grow out of their pride, their sin. They did not grow into spiritual faith. Or, and one of the arguments that's had in that book is a essentially a pastor who's in hell who believed that he had outgrown the teachings of Jesus Christ, that he had surpassed them. Right? He even says, uh, I'm writing a paper. I'm writing a great paper. The paper is on how, uh, you know, if Jesus hadn't been so rash and not been killed because he was kind of too quick, he was too young and kind of got ahead of himself. If he hadn't died, he would have grown up and given us a more mature faith, you know, different beliefs that were more grown up. And then, and I'm really, I'm writing a paper on what those beliefs would look like. That's horrifying, right? But the thing is, there are people who think like that. There are people who think that they've grown out of faith and hope and love now, right? Don't, don't get ahead of yourself, right? We will grow out of these things in eternity when we only have love. But right now, we desperately need to cling to these things, right? We need faith and hope. Here's the other thing about this, this milk, um, I'm sorry, this child analogy. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2 to hunger for spiritual milk uh, like newborn infants. In 1 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul says, I gave you milk and you didn't grow. You're still fleshly. In Hebrews 5, the author says, you should be teaching by now, but you're still on spiritual milk. And then Jesus in the Gospels uh, says, you have to receive the kingdom like children. Right? So the analogy with children is kind of all over the board. Like, okay, am milk bad? Or like, what am I supposed to think about being a child and drinking milk? Right? And so the idea is, I want you to see wherever you are in this process, the answer is always to grow. Okay? If you are an unbeliever, the idea is that you would hunger for the spiritual milk and that you would be born again to new life and that you would be fed by the Spirit and grow, right? The idea then becomes that if you are a new and baby believer, that you would hunger for that spiritual milk and you would consume it constantly, right? Here's the problem, though. So many people stop right there. And, and over and over again, the Scriptures say, yes, okay, you, you, you got saved. You got in the door, you were a baby believer, you hungered for milk. Now, grow. Grow up. Get on solid food. Eat meat. Teach others. Give others milk. Listen, if you are just being passed all the time by brand new believers, what are you doing? Like if you're just sitting here week after week just getting the, like the milk from the from the lessons, you just open up your Bible once a week, get a little milk. Like you're not growing. You know, like, time to get into a bulking season, okay? Like, 
You need to consume solid food, solid spiritual protein, and you need to grow. That is the point. You know, um, I had an instructor in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu who said, he said Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is the fairest uh, is the fairest sport that there ever that there ever was. He said because two people show up on day their both of their day ones together, and they are exactly even, and they will be even. And then they both show up for day two, and they are exactly even. And then day three, only one of them shows up. And now they're no longer even. Because that guy, he's going to get ahead. He's going to learn a little bit more. And then that guy shows up day five, day six, day seven, and then the other guy comes back for his day three. They're not even anymore. They're not on the same level. See, here's the thing about spiritual growth. It's completely fair. It is you spending time with God, growing, eating the meat of being fed by the Spirit, and then obeying. Right? That's how you grow. You you learn the techniques. You exhibit the techniques. You're not earning your salvation. Right? You're responding to it. You're responding to the fact that God has saved you by participating in what the body is doing, by loving others. Grow out of your childish definitions of love, your self-seeking definitions of love, your worldly definitions of love. Eat the meat of the faith and begin to love other people. And then, all of a sudden, it becomes easier to be patient and kind with baby believers who are still on milk. Because they're children. And you turn around and go, it's okay, I was there. I'm going to help you with, with some milk. Why, why do you think people, I mean... Have you guys ever talked to Philip Jackson? He's like the most patient and kind human being alive. And part of the reason is because half the time we walk in there, he's like, oh, they're still on milk. You know? (laughs) And he's just, he just helps us. He just loves on us. That's what he does. And it's like, I want to be that. You know, I want to eat enough meat to get arms like Philip Jackson (laughs) and then sit in my office and just love on people. See what I'm saying? That is what we're called to do, called to grow. Then he he gives a mirror analogy. Now, the Word of God is described as a mirror. James uses this analogy as well. The idea is that it's a reflection that we look at and see how our imperfections don't match Christ. See, here's the idea. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be able to look into Jesus' face and see my perfect reflection. Because I'm going to look just like him. I'm going to be Christ-like perfectly Christ-like. So right now, we've been given a mirror that shows us how Jesus looked, and we're supposed to gaze into it and go, "Mm, not quite there. I'm not exactly how Jesus wants me to be. I need to change some things. I need to adjust. That's why James says that some people look into this mirror and walk away and forget what they look like. They don't fix anything. They don't adjust. The idea is to look into this mirror, but it's described as a dim mirror. Why? Because, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but it would be hard to like write down what I look like and just perfectly picture me in text. That's what we've done with Jesus, right? We're looking at text, trying to like picture him perfectly, and it's really difficult to do. And that's why we were given each other as well, because the idea is as we live out Christ's likeness, we go, yeah, that's it. That's what Christ looked like. But even we are dim reflections, right? So the goal is that we look at this dim reflection of Jesus in the Word and in each other, and we imitate it, right? We imitate Paul as he imitates Jesus. We imitate each other as we are all trying to imitate Jesus. And we grow and look more like Jesus every single day. And then the the beautiful thing is, someday, we will actually look at him face to face, and it'll be perfect. Well, finally, God promises us that we'll look Jesus in the eyes and go, oh, he did it. I look just like Jesus, right? One of the craziest things I've ever heard was this this idea of like, I've never seen Jesus in the flesh, but when I see him, I will be intimately familiar with him. I will know who he is, and it won't even take a second glance. I can't wait to look into Jesus his eyes and see that I'm I'm finally like him. I finally made it. And God is the only reason I ever got there. Look at verse 13. But now 
faith, hope, and love remain. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? Not only because it's the eternal one, because it's the only one that will literally last through eternity, but also because it's the driving factor of human nature. The reason that we live in sin is because we're medicating the loss of God's love in our spirit. The reason that becoming a Christian provides you something where you can finally begin to fight against sin is because you finally have a connection again to the love of God that was lost in your spirit because of sin. See, the separation of God's love because of sin leaves us clamoring for something to fill the void. You've heard of the God-shaped hole? Well, here's the deal. I actually don't like that I, that image because it's like you can kind of piece enough things, cover enough of the, the gaps, like never we're going to get it perfect, but you can get a lot in there. It's not a God-shaped hole. It's a God-sized hole. You can throw things in there all day. They just disappear into the bottomless pit. You need an infinite God to fill that infinite space inside of you. It doesn't work any other way. You are empty without him. That love is seen perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus was given to us by God so that we could truly see God. Jesus came here so that we could comprehend God to the best of our abilities. Martin Luther said that there was a difference between the theologians of glory and the theologians of, of uh, the cross, the theologians of the cross. And Martin Luther said that the theologians of glory spent all their time trying to climb the insurmountable height to find God in the highest parts of heaven. And they missed that while they were climbing up to find God in a place they were never going to reach, Jesus was climbing down past them to come get us. That is a beautiful picture of the gospel. Jesus came to get us. That's love. And by the way, he climbed out of a place where he was at perfect peace with a perfect God, had everything he ever needed, and he came down here and limited himself. He didn't make himself the object of love. He made us the object of his love. He extended that love to us. The goal of the gospel, the goal of the Bible, the goal of being Christ-like is that we would learn how to love. Learn how to love truly. Learn how to love in a way that, that leads people to their eternity. That we would leave childish things behind. That we would stop having a selfish love. Don't just, listen, you can just show up at church and you can just kind of do the church thing. That's literally the Corinthians problem. The church in Corinth is just showing up to the building. And Paul is writing them to say, stop. Stop stop loving yourself and just being in the room together. Make each other the object of your love. Don't just, don't just do church. Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you want to know how you have that relationship? Be plugged into the body. Love the body. He's the head of the church. This is the body. Right? Be selfless. Why do we pair up and pray together after Sunday school all the time? Because we're bearing each other's burdens. Because we're loving on one another. Because we are learning to walk and grow together. We are exhibiting, finally, the right way of loving outwardly and on an object other than ourselves, each other. That is the whole point. right? This is why... This misnomer, if you've ever heard people say, well, I just, I do church at home. No, you don't. By definition, you don't. Because the church isn't at your home. It's not the building. It's us. Love the body. Love the church. Love Jesus Christ. That is what you're called to. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of Young Adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. 
The mission of REACH Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and a sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.